All right. Well, you know what? We are uh, we are right about at the top of the hour. I think we're close enough. So I think we're just going to kick off for tonight and get started with the uh, with the February edition of the Power BI track of the Vancouver Power BI Modern Excel User Group Meetup. Uh, so yeah, let's get started here. Um, let me dive into our slides. Uh, so tonight's meetup, uh, we are into our welcome and overview section now. So I'll just talk for about five minutes here. Um, and then we'll turn it over to Joseph for the What's New in Power BI and Joel for the feature presentation after Joseph is uh, through. So um, first off, uh, as always, a big thanks to the sponsors, uh, SkillWave uh, being the title sponsor here, uh, SkillWave Training being our company um, that Matt Allington and myself run. Uh, we actually were doing a live webcast earlier today with an Ask Me Anything. Uh, there was a new Monkey Shorts video that went out today, so lots of content coming out from SkillWave. Uh, if you're interested in some uh, some high-class training on Excel and Power BI and Power Query and all good things around uh, dealing with data, you should definitely check us out. Uh, our next meetups that we have coming up, i um, pleased to announce that I've got Bill Jell and Mr. Excel himself is going to be here on uh, Thursday, uh, March 3rd, and he's going to be giving us a talk on Excel Oddities, Curiosities, and Mysterious Wonders. Uh, Bill has uh, traveled speaking for tons of time, and uh, he used to like to play a game where he offered prizes to anybody that could stump him, so he's going to share with us some of the best tricks he's learned along the way uh, in that session. So that is open for RSVPs now. Uh, also, pleased to say that I've just managed to lock in my friend Christian Angel. He is going to be here uh, to be doing a talk on the magic of self-joins using Power Query in the real world. So uh, Joseph is excited about this because uh, self-joins are just awesome, aren't they? Um, so uh, just a quick note on that, though. Christian is from Romania, so we're going to be shifting the start time up earlier to 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. So just be aware of that. Of course, there will always be a recording of these things. It's going to be or posted on the ScaleWave channel, uh, YouTube as well. So uh, you can always catch it if you, even if you can't actually make it uh, at that time. Uh, speaking of those recordings, all of our recordings have now moved or are moving to uh, our SkillWave YouTube channel, which you can find here. Um, and I will share the links for those. Uh, once um, Joseph starts kicking off, I'll uh, copy them out of the slide deck and post them in, just in case you need to uh, click on those and subscribe. Lots of new content going into that channel, including, of course, the Monkey Shorts videos, uh, which I just started publishing last month. Uh, we had a brand new one that went out this morning, actually working with uh, data types in Power BI, um, data profiling tools. Uh, these are all short three-minute or uh, videos content. Um, they've got a little frame around them, but uh, three minutes of or less of video content just to get a quick snippet of some cool tips and tricks along the way totally for free. Uh, I'll share that link with you in a bit here as well. The last thing I'm going to say before I uh, jump off the stage for today here is um, if you would like to speak at VanPug, we would love to have you. We are currently recruiting speakers for the 2022 year. If this sounds like something that you think would be a bit of fun to come and show your favorite Excel or Power BI techniques or Power Automate flow, all those kind of different things, as long as it touches on data and fits into the Power Stack somewhere here, uh, we would love to hear about it. So please fill out the survey. I'll drop this link into the uh, the chat. Uh, thank you, Gary, for the uh, for the find comments on uh, the, the your love of the monkey shorts um, I've got a whole bunch more in, in the planning stream so uh, yeah I'm glad to glad to find out they're appreciated so uh, all right on that note let me um, let me fade to black here and uh, Joseph I'm going to uh, turn it over to you and uh, let you take the screen let's do it all right okay. uh, do, do, do. All right, uh, I think we're good to go. So perfect, screen's live. You're good. Perfect. So yeah, well, welcome everyone. February edition of the Vancouver Power BI User Group. Uh, just before I get into the what's new in Power BI for this month, which was released, I think Ken said 12 hours ago in the intro. I think he's being a little generous. I think it was closer to six hours ago, but that's okay. Um, just a little bit about me. So my name's Joseph Yates, and I'm a subject matter expert. Uh, at the Business Intelligence and Data Analysis Program at Corporate Finance Institute. So we're an e-learning company um, that does training and tra yeah, in person and but mostly virtual training for all tools across sort of business intelligence and data science. Uh, so last month I actually was the feature present presenter at, at the user group uh, and I presented on Python in Power BI. Uh, so up here on my website feathersanalytics.com. If you go to presentations, 
Python integration and Power BI. Uh, and as Ken said at the beginning, uh, that video is on the SkillWave YouTube channel. Uh, so if you missed it, interested in Python and Power BI, be sure to check it out. Uh, but with that, we can head to what is new in Power BI for February 2022. Uh, so as always, there is a, a monthly blog post for the, for the release that summarizes all the new features that, that have come out. Um, so I won't have a chance to get through all of these features today, but I always like bringing attention to this blog post. Just, you know, it's, it's a great resource. There's YouTube videos kind of embedded uh, and links to additional resources as well. Uh, so a lot of the new reporting updates for this month um, have been made generally available. So these features were previously in preview. Um, they've gone through a bit of beta, and now uh, they're generally available within Power BI Desktop. Uh, one that I've covered in previous month is the new format pane in Power BI. So it's now on by default, uh, which, which is fine. You don't have to toggle a little button anymore. Uh, we have some additional new data connectivity, so some new connectors for the Power Query Editor in Power BI, uh, some updates in the Power BI service for Power BI goals, some enhancements to our deployment pipelines, uh, and further down. But the my favorite feature from this month, uh, and one that I'm probably going to spend the majority of the time going through, just a really, really quick demonstration of, is the are the dynamic mQuery parameters, uh, because now they support uh, SQL Server and some more databases and servers that they weren't able to connect with before. Uh, so this feature was in preview uh, previously, just with more limited uh, direct query data sources, and now it's been expanded. So, so that's what we're going to dive into today. Um, just at the bottom of this section in the blog post, we can see additional uh, resources for documentation or a video demo. Uh, so the the documentation lo looks a bit like this. It's a great step-by-step -step guide to go down to see how we can enable dynamic M query parameters. Um, really easy to follow along. Uh, we can see exactly all the different steps we need to do to set that up. Uh, and this is a similar process to what I'll be going through today. So if I head back into Power BI, and I'm not sure why that change screens or monitors on me, but here we go. Uh, and if we look at my data model within this report, we can see that my uh, GL trans view has this sort of blue line across the top, and we can see that the storage mode for that is a direct query. So if we want to use dynamic uh, M parameters, we need to have a direct query to our data source. We can't be using import mode. Uh, and then how I can set this up is if I go into the Power Query Editor, we can take a little bit of a closer look at this table. So I'm connecting to a uh, SQL database, and we can see the server and the uh, database name here in the connection string. Uh, and in fact, I've written a really basic uh, SQL query to actually pull just a subset of the data from this view. Uh, so if I hit the gear icon, we can bring up a little bit more information. So again, we see the server, the database, and I'm just selecting star from our view where our region num is equal to C1. OK. Uh, so if, we, if we've used parameters within the Power Query editor before, what we've what we've typically done is that if we're connecting to uh, an an SQL source, we can uh, update and modify the parameter from within the Power Query editor itself. So if I go to new parameter here, I can set a set up a new parameter within Power Query. So it's a Power Query parameter, uh, and we can call it glnum. Uh, for type, we can say decimal number, and we'll just put it at 1,000 for now. And so once I've set that up, what I want to do is filter this GL account number column to only return rows where the value of the GL account number is equal to the value currently in the parameter. Uh, so I think actually in 
October-ish, Ken had a full presentation on parameters and different objects within Power Query. Um, would would really recommend that that you check that out on YouTube. Uh, I'm not going to have time to get into a really deep dive around parameters now. Um, but but what this allows us to do is have some variable content from within from within the Power Query editor. So rather than write uh, a SQL parameter and have variable content there, I can do it from within the Power Query editor. So I can update our connection string here to say rather than just where region num is equal to C1, and that's actually hard coded in that connection to my to my database, I can update it to say where GL account num is equal to, and then I just need to reference this GL num parameter that, that I've created. And oh, let me finish typing in. We'll have to change it to to text because right now my parameter is a decimal number, but to be part of the connection string, we have to convert that decimal number to text. So I'm going to take my GL num parameter, change it to text, and then add this like that. So now we have where our GL account number from our view is equal to our GL num parameter here. Uh, let's have an uppercase L. And then we're still leaving where region num is equal to C1. And once I commit that, we can see that we have a GL account num only for 1,000. So OK, great. Let's close and load that. So all, all of this we've been able to do previously. This isn't anything new in Power Query. Uh, but what dynamic parameters now allow us to do is to be able to update that Power Query parameter which impacts the data we're bringing in from our data source directly in our dashboard. So what I need to do to set this up is if I go to the data view, I'm going to create a new table. Like this, and we'll use the generate series function. And I want to bring in or create a table of values that start at 1,000 because that's the first GL number, goes up to 9,900, and we want to go up by hundreds. So I should have a table that looks like this. We can see 1,000, 1,100, 1,200, and so on and so forth. So if I go back to my model view, I can look at my new table that I've generated. And if I click on this value column, which is the only column from that table, under advanced, we now have this option to bind to parameter. So I can decide to bind this to GL number like that. Uh, and then as soon as I've set that from the drop down menu, we can see that the icon next to value has changed. It's now this parameter value. So if I go back to my dashboard, uh, on this page here, and we're just refreshing, refreshing my card visual. Do we can see that we're only returning uh, one GL account for a thousand, which is what I've set in the Power Query editor, and returning some information, so like our GL account name and our GL chat amount. But I can set up a new filter on my dashboard which takes the value from this new table that I created. And if I change um, the filter from on the slicer from 1,000 to 1,100, say, we can see that when I've done that, this, uh, this visual will refresh because from within the Power BI report itself, I'm able to change the, this parameter. It will pass to my, to my database and then return just a subset of information. If I go back to my data view now, and I go back to, to my view, a table with direct query cannot be shown, uh, but we're only returning a single GL account number. If I toggle that again to a different GL number, like 1200, uh, it's taking a little bit of time, I think probably just because I'm presenting with Teams, but now we're able to interactively and dynamically connect to our data source, define within the dashboard only a subset of data that we want to return using this direct query connection. And this can help make our, uh, our report 
perform better. We, we can help optimize some of the performance with our report because instead of bringing data and GL transactions for all of our GL account numbers, we can actually just determine directly within the report itself, only return these rows from the view, and that will help speed up um, our reporting a little bit. Uh, so that's the demo that I wanted to go through today. I um, would really encourage you to check out both uh, parameters within Power Query. Uh, as I said, I know we've had a presentation on parameters um, for the user group in some previous months, so they'll be up on YouTube. Uh, and definitely check out dynamic M parameters in Power BI. Uh, this was a really quick demo, but we can definitely expand sort of the possibility and the capability of this functionality. Um, and it's only going to get better and improve sort of in subsequent months where the scope of this functionality um, expands in future releases. Uh, but with that, I'm really happy to pass it back to Ken, pass it back to Joel, and we can get into the feature presentation. So thank you everyone for your time today. That was my favorite feature for what's new in Power BI from uh, six hours or so ago for February. <laughs> uh, and I'm looking forward to presenting what's new next month as well. Awesome, thanks, Joseph. Um, I see one quick comment from Ron uh, that the refresh after changing the GL is really slow. And I mean, I, I think uh, one thing I would definitely comment on that, because I know as uh, being a presenter with this stuff, is when you got teams running, um, that usually at least halves the amount of bandwidth you've got. So there's definitely yeah. that. But I think it would also depend on how big your data set is and, and all that definitely. kind of jazz, too. Yeah. So. Um, but duly noted. Um, all right. Any rate, uh, thanks, Bud. I appreciate it. Um, fantastic job as always, and uh, I'm glad you picked Power Query stuff because I love Power Query, and that is uh, really darn cool. Um, so uh, now I got to go start playing with it. Uh, any rate, um, it is my pleasure now to uh, to welcome uh, Joel Gagnon to the uh, the floor here. And uh, he did not think I could pronounce his last name correctly when we were talking beforehand. So at least I hopefully got that part right. Uh, so um, yeah, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Uh, one of the big things that uh, we did talk about before this all started folks is the chat window is open so as Joel is presenting here if you have questions please fire them into the chat uh, I will moderate that and uh, and attempt to interrupt at opportune times to ask any questions uh, that um, that need some clarification so Joel the floor is yours Awesome. Uh, thank you very much. And first, thank you, Ken, to invite me uh, here. It's always a, a pleasure for me to meet uh, fellow Canadians and to, to to meet different communities. Uh, so uh, I will present you. I have my little deck that I prepared with love for you uh, about uh, a topic that I really care about. Let me know when you see my screen. I can see it. Looks good. Looks good. Wow, well, good. Awesome. Okay, so uh, as you mentioned, Ken, uh, as we go over the presentation, if there's a pertinent question, just uh, let me know. I'll jump in and uh, see if I can find uh, a good answer. Okay, so uh, so so today, uh, maximizing the impact of Power BI application through improved uh, user experience. So uh, this is a topic that uh, that I love and that uh, is uh, my main job at the moment. So uh, uh, first, let me introduce me to you. Uh, I'm a CPA. I started as an accountant at Bombardier Aerospace, uh, Power BI expert. Uh, and I deploy Power BI solutions in medium large organization for many years now. Uh, actually, I started uh, in 2013 uh, working with Power Query and Power Pivot. Uh, Power BI did not exist back then. So, and I, I started to, to work with uh, the, the, the solution back then. Um, at that time, uh, I was a financial analyst, so I did financial analyst for 10, 12 years, something like that. And uh, I came to the conclusion that uh, the Excel was not enough. Uh, I had to make a lot of strategic presentation to CFO, CEO, and many management uh, committees. So that's where I, I got introduced to the importance of great communications as well as great data. And so I now I I, I became a Power BI developer. Uh, yeah, so that, that's that, that's uh, that's where it started. Uh, I'm currently working in a, as, as a, on a consulting contract at Desjardins Power BI Excellence Center. 
uh, on a monthly basis, uh, I meet hundreds of developers and I have to provide the advices on whatever they do. And uh, user experience is uh, something that is recurring. So that's something that uh, I uh, always enjoy uh, discussing uh, of and uh, that, that's the kind of advice I provide uh, most of the time. So slide number two. Uh, first, I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, the mastering of technical aspect of Power BI does not ensure success of applications. Um, you may have great security, you may have a great data set, your queries may be super long and super, uh, super everything, everything in the background might be great. But uh, in the end, uh, your, your report may be very bad. Uh, I'll just show you some common shortcomings. Uh, the, the overall uh, topic of a page may be unclear. Um, many many items added add no little or no value. And the important Im information is not always obvious. So, so th that's three shortcomings, that three little things that uh, uh, I mentioned here. And I'll also uh, put the emphasis on the image. The image is uh, somebody who tried to sell his um, uh, developer, Power BI developer service. Uh, and, and this is the demonstration he put on the community website. Uh, the, so, so what we see is that the, the overall topic of this page is not clear. We have to go back to the, the page one or even to, the, to the, 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 the community web page to understand what it is about. Uh, the page is filled with filters or blanks, so this adds little, no value at all. And what is important in this page, we understand that it is these little uh, uh, boxes, cards there, but uh, what is important is not that clear. So even if the data is awesome, the security is great, even of all this, then this is still a bad report. So. It, so yeah, so even if the technical is good, the report is bad. Uh, next slide. Um, I did some research and uh, by the, uh, most Power BI developers are unfamiliar with the concept of user experience. It may have to do with uh, the way we are trained, uh, our background. Some of us come from an IT background, which uh, prefer techie stuff over um, so over simple and uh, the user experience. Some other people may come from the business side, uh, and those person tends to be just excited by the all the functionality possible. Uh, at the same time, I did my little analysis and um, I went through by. Uh, Every week I went over, I listened to hours of blog and I read tons of blogs on Power BI. And my conclusion is that there is almost no material dedicated to user experience in Power BI. So uh, I made this little research and give some little example. Uh, the, the Power BI blog, and I guess I should change the logo there, but uh, the, the, the Power BI blog, uh, guy in a cube, Radakad, SQL BI, Kerbal, and I guess I could name many, many, many others. Uh, they rarely mention user experience. Uh, sometimes they will talk about storytelling, storytelling, and there's the, the way they speak about it is mostly to, to have a, a visual that is fit for the message or to have a conditional formatting or something more uh, to, 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 to have a page that is easier to navigate with uh, well, st basic storytelling on a page or a visual. Uh, something interesting is a, a, a set, a playlist of report from Guy in a Cube about the report for consumers. So that shows it's supposed to be for consumers, so they go there and they learn basic functionalities, how they can drill, how they can uh, how they can use all these uh, basic functionalities of Power BI. Um, unfortunately, there's no equivalent for the developers. Here's what here's what the consumer expects, and here's how to deliver it, or something like that. So, in in any ways, uh, my 
to, as I see the hundreds of developers on a monthly basis, I, I still came to the conclusion that the most of them are not that familiar to the concept of user experience. So that that's why I created this presentation. And uh, you'll see as um, there's not much that exists as of now, uh, I had to be creative and to find ideas in other fields than Power BI. So you'll see. Um, user experience. Why am I talking about that? Because it is important. It is a key success factor. It is a key success factor. Th this slide is not about Power BI. It is about the web. Uh, it was published on the uh, Harvard Business Review, so it's it's supposed to be credible at some point. Uh, what it says is that a study found that websites can expect to double their subscription by increasing the user experience, their user experience from medium to excellent. So when we look at the graph, a user experience, a UX score of three, four, five delivers three subscriber or the subscription index. If you just increase the, the, the isolated, the UX, uh, they, they isolate the UX effect, and they came to the conclusion that the same websites with a user experience of nine to 10 would deliver six subscribers. So uh, the, I, I could not find similar study for Power BI. What I found was my own experience, and it is exactly what it does. You take uh, you take a VP, a team that uh, you take a team where uh, the developers are not fully aware of user experience. Uh, you just change the way they work, they change the way they deliver, you change the, and you change what they deliver in the end. And yes, it uh, it certainly doubled the uh, the quantity of unique viewer of views on their report. This is, this is my experience. Uh, I would add that, um, I would add that uh, it is not the thing that cost the most. So the, uh, the return on investment is quite intense uh, in this in this situation. So it is a key a key success factor. It is important, and that's why I'm doing this presentation. Uh, user experience is a vast subject. Um, I won't uh, get deep into all the subjects. The one I'm the most interesting interested in is usability. Usability is uh, how to create reports and pages and app and dashboards that are easy to read and uh, that are easy and pleasant to read. This is what we are looking for, how to make it simple, easy, pleasant. So um, I had to find uh, this um, uh, the five component of usability. I, I, uh, I found uh, this information, uh, yeah, this model was for the web. So when you design a web page, uh, those are pretty common uh, vocabulary and models that they use to test their website. So starting from there, I say, well, why, why not to do it uh, with Power BI too? And it, it, it makes some sense as Power BI is also a website and uh, people come from, uh, say everybody has their experience with all the websites on earth, they come to Power BI, should it really have, does it really has to be different? Not necessarily, so they start with what they learn ev elsewhere and they, they come in Power BI and they, so this is their background. Anyway, five components of usability. So there is a five component and the five components as we'll see are the, um, I will have a page for each of them and provide some example. How, how does it work in Power BI? So first, uh, learnability. How easy it is for users to accomplish basic tasks for the first time they, they encounter the design. So learnability. Um, efficiency. Once users have learned the design, how quickly can they perform tasks? Uh, memorability, a new word for me. When users return to the design after a period of uh, not working 
not using it, how easily can they reestablish proficiency? Uh, error, how many errors do users make? How severe are these errors? And how easily can they recover from the errors? And finally, the satisfaction, how pleasant is it to use the design? So this is the five components of usability. This is what they do for the, for the websites. And that's what I propose to, to see how can we use this how can we use this model and knowledge in Power BI? So, so that's it. Let's go. Number one, learnability. Um, mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive content makes your app easy to learn. This concept of the messy, messy, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. This is um, usually it's used for um, PowerPoint presentation, but it fit very well with uh, Power BI too. Uh, what it means, uh, let's start with collectively exhaustive content. Uh, you take an, uh, in your company, you take an homogeneous group. And my example is about the CEO. Okay, the CEO and closed team. You take the CEO and you try to, to put all the content that person, those person needs in the, for their work at, in the same application. So what does a CEO needs to do, needs to do his work? He needs, well, financial report, opportunity report, operational reports. And finally, as the, this is a lot of, uh, of data, a lot of stuff, let's create a, a dashboard, dashboard for that person and yeah, I propose business unit too. So, um, so collectively exhaustive. When the CEO asks himself, "Where do I go to get these crazy reports and to know if things going well?" That's easy. There's only one place. Everything is there. So, you can also add your Excel file. You can create some URL to everywhere else. So the, the idea is uh, use the use the application as a portal. This is where this is a place where you may start uh, you, you may start your day because everything is there. So this is the collectively exhaustive thing. Now the mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive means that uh, um, every report has one subject and every page has one and only one subject, and you specialize that page to do only one thing. I often see the, uh, I often see people trying to mix and match different measures from different perspective and, and to mix everything in a page uh, in a report page that they call a dashboard. The results is never good. Uh, what I what I recommend is always to on each each page should have one subject and to uh, and to explain and to fully explain this subject in a single page. So if I take my financial report, uh, actual versus budgeted, well, whatever you need to know about actual versus budgeted is there. So drill, drill your visual, filter the visual, everything uh, has to be there. And let's not mix that with last year, the forecast, or uh, even the, the, the leads and, and waste and uh, capacity versus sales. You One page, one subject, and let's make it uh, let's make that topic great in this page. If uh, when you need a place to mix to mix visual from different perspective from different report, uh, I recommend to use a dashboard for sure. So uh, so so this is a thing. So mutually exclusive means one thing does uh, every page does uh, answer only one question. Every report only answer only one set of uh, answer and let's not uh, mix things over. So uh, yeah, so 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 this is uh, I, I often see in the uh, I often see with my clients that they have one report for um, one application and that's a super report. Let's say it's a, a, an HR report. So everybody in the company should come into that report and to see and to get their report and to get their information. So one report, one application at the end of the day, 
you have to you need access to let's say the 10 20 application to get all your information uh, this may be easy for analysts but for, but for management persons that, that's just too long that's just too many clicks that's too many places to look at um yeah so 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 that that's the benefit of having everything at the same place okay um second efficiency uh, applying storytelling techniques to app make the navigation more efficient uh, again on this one i could not find any uh, documentation about power bi so i had to find information somewhere else um, movies and theater use the three act structure so I, it's in the source so, so what it does is we have a three act uh, structure for a play or for a movie uh, and i give you an example of a very efficient story te storytelling technique applied to an app act number one uh, the manager open power bi he goes into the dashboard. So this is the act one. Manager identify an indicator showing a non-favorable result. Uh, the manager goes straight to the specific report, click, flowing, and then it goes to the report. Act number two, the report, the manager sorts, filter, drill, analysis. It's easy to analyze and to understand the problem. Uh, the manager find the point person uh and arrange and, and arranges to meet with him and that's it we go out of power bi act number three we have a meeting we discuss about the problem we find solution we create an action plan and the forecast is updated so we have to count the quantity of click the person have to do uh, in order to reach to to, to complete this story uh, so we see in there, the person goes into the dashboard, one click to the report, then maybe a few sorts and filter, let's say four or five clicks. Uh, we may have to drill through uh, another page, so let's say a six click, and then you know who who's the owner of the problem and uh, what is the problem and uh, some clues on the by, and some clues on to what happened and uh, what should be done. So yeah, so storytelling techniques based on app. Number three, memorability. Default Power BI features make your report easier to read. Okay, so on this one, uh, this one generate more questions usually. So what we see here is just a report page. What I recommend is to use only default visuals, not because they are necessarily better, but because that's the one your user will recognize easily and that's the one your user will interpret right the first time. I know that the Microsoft Marketplace offers tons and tons and hundreds of uh, different visuals. Some of them are super efficient and uh, from uh, an analyst point of view, there's even um, artificial intelligence included in some of them. That's awesome. But uh, when your manager goes in there, uh, the managers has to think they has to think 20, 30, a minute to interpret just this new visual that you never saw before. And uh, in this minute, you've lost maybe half of your audience. So that's why I recommend only use default visuals. That's the one everybody recognizes in a wink. And uh, that, that, that that's easy. If everybody use them, then it's easier for to, to read your report. Uh, second, um, all the reports should be formatted with a corporate, uh, a corporate team, a PBIT. Like y y y your organization color should be there. Uh, it, it should, it should look and uh, it should look like your company. Like uh, maybe you should sit down with uh, your people in communications, the one that create your uh, PowerPoint presentation, the, 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 the template, the, the PowerPoint template, and just work with them to find the good colors and to find the good background and to find 
anything that uh, in the end, so, so yes, so, and create a PBIT and make sure all your reports use the same theme. That way, uh, when your manager will navigate through the reports, he won't get lost, he won't get confused because they, they, they kind of all look the same, so it's reassuring for them. And that uh, that way that, yeah, that, that, that it's bad. Uh, th th you have a better chance to uh, cut his attention that way. Um, a third functionality that I really enjoy, personalize this visual. Uh, you may already, it's an option that is not by default and I recommend to make it by default. You may have a hundred or thousand of user that goes into your report. Uh, you don't know what they will do with this report. You, they, you have a clue, uh, you have some clues on what people will do with the report, but not completely. So let them use it, let them make their mind, uh, uh, let them uh, use it and make it adjust the report the way they really want to see it. That way, um, that way, uh, th that that may generate some ideas for you in the future. They'll be back to you and say, "Well, that's how I want to see it," or they may say, "Can you create this new categorization or th this new group uh, in a in a dimension?" Uh, so that, that's a very good feature that should be on all the time. Uh, filter panel, that's where people get emotive. Um, if, if you have to choose between filter panels and slicer, I warmly recommend you to always use filter panel. It takes, it takes five seconds to put in place. Uh, this is... Uh, it takes five seconds to put in place. This is a place where you can put 20 uh, different kind of filters and that won't affect at all the uh, the look of your report. If you remember the, the first page I show you with this uh, ugly report on the first page, uh, well, um, a lot of the page of the space add no value. So if you put all your filters in the, in, in the, fil in the filter panel, then uh, th then you don't um, you don't lose any value there. So 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 that's it. That's my point on these. Uh, also, uh, something recurring. So the, the kind of feedback I have to do the recurringly. Make sure these functionalities always deliver coherent results. The, the drill on the visuals or between pages often doesn't work quite quite well or not perfect. Uh, always make sure there's a title on everything, on the, uh, on every page, on every uh, on on every report, uh, a title that that is clear on every page, on every visual too. If you can use, uh, if you can drill into a visual, make sure auto title works well. Interactions also, uh, visual and page filter uh, too. So. If you have a uh, hundred or two hundred or a thousand users, uh, don't be shy and put put tons of different visuals and different visual on the page. You don't know how people will use it, and this is with time that people will uh, will tell you, well, this one yes, this one no, this one yes, this one no. So, so page filters, uh, visual filters are important too. Uh, when people click on visuals, as we see on the page, visual on this visual shows up. This is, I would hide them all, all the time. Just because, put yourself in the place of a manager, you open a report and wherever you click, you have different set of filter and and then you get lost and that, 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 that yeah, that's quite sad. So I would recommend to always hide the, uh, the, the, the visual filters because they, they don't have that much value. You can use the filter on the page and to have the same results. And they may create some uh, confusion as some, some visuals are filtered in a certain way, others not. And people just forget that they can reset the, uh, the default filters on the page. Uh, finally, Q and A's. Uh, make sure it deliver current results. If somebody in the audience uh, has ever achieved that, then uh, let me know because I need to see that and then I need to uh, give you uh, a beer or something because, uh, yeah, 
I, I'm dreaming of this functionality, but I, I just never achieved it. Anyway. So next page. So well, uh, before you move on to the next page, um, we've actually got a question, I think, that actually came for the previous page. If you go back to your three-act um, thing here, uh, Ron S. was asking, uh, are, are you suggesting that dr the drill down on the dashboard will actually help identify the person that's responsible uh, for, the, for the meeting uh, at the end of the day? How do you accomplish that? Okay, bye. Um... Uh, let's say the, the money. Uh, let, let's go back to the story. The the, um, uh, the manager has different business unit. On the dashboard, you see that an indicator sales is going down. So you click on it on the report. Uh, the manager has the ability to filter, to drill, and to find that uh, uh, a specific business unit is under pressure or the results are lower than expected. So so yeah. So the uh, then uh, the, the answer may be in the data, a, a field that is dropped in the report that identify that person, or it could be that, uh, yeah, the, this business unit belongs to this person and that's where we called it. Am Fair I answer? Enough. Yeah, okay. I, I, I think so. I mean, I, I think, um, I guess the, the question I'm thinking, if I'm, if I'm paraphrasing Ron correctly, is really about, I mean, do you expect the, uh, the thing to kick back a result that says, go call Mary because Mary's responsible for this? Or do you more expect them to say, hey, look, you know what? I know that Mary is responsible for business, you know, for this particular business unit because I've been working at the company long enough. But this problem, this looks like her issue. So I'm going to go talk to her. And I, I would suggest it's probably more of the latter rather than kicking out um, an actual printed piece that says this is you know, this problem goes to this person, is my guess. Yeah, sure. Uh, I tend to think that at the end of the day, say when you're done looking at the report, uh, you need an action that has to do at some time. So at, uh, at some point in your navigation, in, in your story, you have to identify somebody. So uh, I know it's always sensible and people are always surprised when I just drop in the name of the managers or dropping the name of and uh, but uh, it has to be done. So at the end, if we don't uh, identify a problem, identify who's the owner of the action plan, then nothing happens. So it has, to, it has to be there somewhere. Otherwise, we don't add much value. So we, we have a better knowledge, but uh, better knowledge worth nothing if there's no action plan. Yeah, fair enough. Ron, does that uh, does that answer? So, okay, so as Cindy says, drilling down into the business unit or person to add transparency to us. I think that's probably a fair comment. Does that answer the uh, the question for you, Ron? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, the the other question that we got um, really, I guess, goes more towards the uh, the next slide, and I think this is probably more of a debate point than uh, than anything else. Is um, <laughs> exclusively using the filter pane can get uh, get quite confusing. Um, I would say myself personally, I love the cross filtering of visuals. I'm not a huge fan of the filter pane, but you know, I guess it kind of depends on on what the purpose is of the story and your own philosophy on some of these things. But uh, I mean, do you have, do you have more thoughts or comments on that? You you prefer the filter pane for rather than cross filtering? My, uh, some uh, some reports will need a lot of uh, different filters. Some other reports won't need that many, say one, two, or three, and it's enough. So uh, I was uh, put, uh, I was often put in that situation where if you want to standardize the experience of your user, uh, you will not be able to put say 20 slicers in the page, as we saw at say slide number three. You know? So if you're not to put 20 slicers on the page, and if you want to standardize the experience. Then the filter name, the filter uh, panel is your like your last, uh, your only option. So, yeah. So, so that that's 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 uh, that's why it is my preference. Fair enough. Awesome. Uh, one last comment just before we move on here, um, and this is just a general tip comment from uh, from Pranam, which I think sort of kind of underscores what you're talking about here with this whole thing. Uh, Power BI, according to from what Pranam says, I think Power BI is marketed to most end users as a Microsoft Excel report for data rather than interactive PowerPoint for data from a data viz perspective. And I, I would generally have to agree with that. I mean, it's uh, I think there's a different set of skills here that are needed to, in order to present this stuff properly. 
which is why we're having this conversation in the first place today, isn't it? Exactly. Awesome. I think that's it for now. So. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks for the comment, Lou. Uh, you know, it's almost 10 p.m. and uh, some say uh, I blew my my content, but uh, it's good to have feedback. So do not hesitate. <laughs> So, okay, here, uh, number four, errors. Um, I got some tricks to reduce the quantity of errors. Uh, column and, uh, the, the first one, column and measure description redu reduce the risk of errors uh, for the report authors. So we put ourselves uh, in a situation where um, Imagine there's a golden data set and many user wants to create some new reports based on this uh, golden data set. Uh, so uh, if you don't take the time to add a description to all your fields and all your measures, all, all your columns and measures, then the report author uh, will have to guess what is included in there. So that's why in this example, um i have a i have a set of measure one is scenario one that is picked uh, right here so scenario one and i just copy paste my dax in there so i may add some other text and say well this uh, scenario is used in that report or or, or whatever but uh, in the end what is the most important for um for a measure is to know what is included in there so Somebody who use scenario one to to create a new report will know that uh, if has one value, ah, okay, it has to be one value of something, and otherwise it won't show up. So, so yeah. So add your description if you do a golden data set. That's I think that's that's not common, and that's very useful to reduce the quantity of errors. Uh, two other. Uh, that, Two other ideas that I uh, always try to put in place. Uh, I will start with the second. Uh, you may share a pre-formatted Analyze in Excel template in the navigation bar of your Power BI application. So you're in the Power BI application, and people, if people want to work with Excel, that's fine. But instead of starting from scratch, uh, connecting to the data model and then try to find some uh, explicit measures and to find the, 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 the to add some dimension. So create a pre-formatted analyze in Excel template where uh, you have to each tab may be one fact, one fact table with the main uh, measure and you add some some columns some dim dimensions in there so that way when people uh, go in to use your template they always know what uh, uh, what should be the total of the page because the yeah it's a template and it's validated so that that really help and this also have for the performance as uh, you don't start your report with a star star kind of query and finally, uh, a help button. I don't have example right there, but uh, uh, you may have a help page or a help button. You click on it and it tells you say, for the new users, well, you can interact and you can uh, you can filters and uh, you can drill your report so that that may help to to reduce the risk of errors. Okay. Uh, next, satisfaction. That's, this is my fifth uh, thing, my, my fifth uh, usability component. So collecting feedback in the application, in the application helps identify issues and opportunities. So what I like to do in my application is to add the Microsoft Forms. Did you find the information you need to do your work? And they, they, they say yes or no. Was it simple and pleasant to find your information? Yes or no. And uh, what is missing to this application to be exceptional? And you collect that kind of feedback. Uh, th that brings me to the, the this ID to uh, points to um, that uh, we are never done uh, improving our Power BI reports and applications. There, there will always be some new comments and some people who want to do something 
uh, they automatize even more of their work. They want to stop using Excel, so to to do so they may need some more information in the data set or in a new report. So uh, the, the waterfall approach, uh, when you do some Power BI reports, work, works up to a point because uh, you need some resources to continue the improvement and evolution of your reports and application. So it won't be perfect the day one, uh, whatever the quantity of money you put in, uh, you have to think about it. It's not a sprint, it's more like a marathon thing where it's continuous improvement. So Microsoft Form works. Uh, I just found that uh, the URI mail to, uh, instead of uh, HTTP uh, two point, Mail to works too, so uh, so that way it's in the navigation bar. People click on email us plume and that generate an email and you may uh, pre-format the title and the content of the email. So like uh, send us some ID, they click on it in Vlung, uh, Outlook open, and it is already it is ready to send feedback. So so that's it. Uh, we are already, uh, so that's it for the, the, the five components of user experience. And now the next slide is to put that into action. So how do we, say that those, are all, those are all great ideas, but how to put that into action? The first thing to do is to create a checklist to test your reports before they go live. Um, I, I won't. I won't do it for you. But uh, in this presentation, I think I have 25 advices that I provided that uh, you can already put into your checklist. Uh, something very easy. You know, does the page as a title? Does the visual as title? Does the the filter works? Does it always coherent? And then you add the uh, you add all of these into your checklist. And what you do, and uh, once you have your checklist of the the best practice of user experience, what you do with that? Well, if you are a premium user, you may you will be able to use the deployment pipeline. And in the deployment pipeline, in the test environment, uh, you you ask your tester to go in there and to uh, to to. to, 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 to to check and uncheck and to add comments on every visuals where it is not working as uh, it should. Uh, I have an example here. Uh, th there's this common functionality in Power BI that is uh, amazing um, to test the reports and for nothing else, but to test the report is very good. So we are in the, in the, the test application. Uh, we click on a visual that is not working properly. We click on the three bullets here, add comments, add comments, and then I may tag the developer. Hey, uh, can you add, add the conditional formatting on the top results? Because that, that's how people need to see it. And that's part of the checklist. And then Elizabeth may answer me, well, uh, here's the new version. Can you confirm it works? And then uh, I reply and say, yes, that works. Thank you very much. And and that's how we test. So um, uh, where all the snags, where all the where where are every everything commented and uh, documented, all the snags, easy. It's all in the, the test application. So uh, yeah, so. So that would be it. So tester publish the report in the test application. Uh, you don't need the uh, deployment, say premium and the deployment pipeline to do tests. So you just need uh, at least uh, two workspaces, one for test, one for production. Developer publish their report in the test application. The tester uh, follow the checklist and assess the user experience. Uh, they attach the comment directly to the visuals and to the pages. So uh, somebody may uh, test only the user experience. Somebody else may check the numbers. Does the, the total is the total is good, and, and somebody from business may do that. So uh, the two tester is not too much to have a great report. And uh, once all, all the issues have been corrected, then the administrator uh, deploy the report in the production application. So when when there are 
uh, hundreds of users. It's better when the, the developer don't publish themselves the report into production. It's good to have an administrator to do that. So just, just somebody else, the administrator goes into the the test application, you look at all the the, the message thread uh, and says, uh, has all the snag been resolved? Yes, okay, so we are ready to publish into production. So that's that's how uh, that's how we do it. So yeah, so that 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 was kind of the presentation. Ten o'clock. Um, all right. Uh, so Ron's made a comment. He says, personally, I got used to working with at least three environments, development, test, and production. <laughs> that doesn't sound like overkill to me at all. I, I mean, uh, we see the same thing happen in uh, in lots of different uh, um, different worlds, I think, as well. So, yeah, that makes sense. Um, other questions, folks, from uh, at all for uh, Joel here? Um, we got some hand clapping emojis. That doesn't seem like a question so much, but, uh, <laughs> but that's good. <laughs> um, um, all right, Gary said uh, Edward Tufte has written several books on displaying numeric data. His first book, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information, is a Bible. Uh, yeah, Tufte's got some awesome stuff out there. Um, definitely agree. Um, uh, da, 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 da. The first bad example of the Power BI report was so typically Canadian, it had a mix of English and French on it. Really? I didn't know that. But it didn't say sorry on it anywhere, did it? Because it can't be Canadian, <laughs> sorry somewhere. Maybe that happens if you click a button and something doesn't work. So <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> that's funny. I didn't actually notice that, but uh, that's hilarious. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, I, I don't see any any uh, um, crazy questions for it in here as well. I think I, I just like to say thanks. I mean, obviously, I mean, it's uh, some really, uh, um, yeah, as, as uh, Chris is saying here, thoughtful and practical advice. Um, you know, I know personally from uh, coming from an Excel reporting background, uh, I mean, you know, this is a lot of the stuff that I think about when I'm building Excel reports, but uh, I would definitely agree. I mean, when I'm moving over to Power BI, people uh, don't seem to apply a, a discipline to it. It's about stuffing as much into a page as they possibly can without a clear visual or visualization of what their their end story is and how they're trying to get the message across to the user. So it's nice to see some some information put together on uh, on how to go through and actually you know deal with that better. Uh, oh, Jeff's asking, hey, do you use bookmarks as a technique for simulating slicers and filters? Uh, yes, I do. I do. Um, uh, so, sometimes, uh, sometimes in your report, there's are two ways of looking at it. So you you may yeah, it's, it, 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 there's a one report and two views, a views for the analyst and a view for the management, and they, I, I use that often. Uh, two different kind, many different kind of user. If you are um, an analyst from that business unit, you click on it and this adjusts all the visuals on your page. If you come from the finance department, you click on it and this adjusts the filters too. So yes, yes, I would use it uh, always. Awesome. Uh, Ron's asking if you can add some links to the various resources mentioned at the start. Um, if I recall correctly, you've You've cited a bunch of the links in all of your individual slides that you actually put as well. Are we able to get a copy of the slide deck to share for, for the folks? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Awesome. Um, Ron, are those the links you were actually looking for, or is there is there other ones uh, specifically that you're after? I just noticed too. Actually, this is quite interesting to me. Is that uh, on my uh, on my team's tenant, um, it's listed as uh, Ron S. Uh, it's listed as Ron S. Guest, and uh, on your team's tenant, which I can see on screen right now, it's Ron S. Guest Invite. So that that's both English and French going on in uh, in one comment. How about that? Um, those in the new features section before Joel. Oh, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, the link for uh, the um, the blog post that uh, that Joseph linked to. Uh, we will find that one and get that one up there as well for sure. Um, Awesome. Uh, oh, there you go. Here's another one. Yep. Do you use GIFs or, or some people pronounce them GIFs, uh, to show new users advanced Power BI functions on a report such as drill down, etc.? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, in my um, uh, fourth slide, to, to reduce the risk of errors, uh, I I put it that in the risk of error, but uh, yes, a, a help button. They click on it, 
an image app appears with various print screen and some on how to drill, how to filter, how to how to say for so for the people that just started with Power BI, they don't know about the interactions. They don't know they can click control and that that makes better interactions. They don't know how to drill, so it to be taught to them at some point. So it could be an additional page at the end of the, your application. It could be, uh, yeah, or it could be on uh, on a few key pages where you have a help button, you click on it, and following you have some uh, uh, help visuals that shows up. So yes, awesome. I, would, I would put cool. that as important. I've actually never thought of doing one, doing, putting one of those into a report. That's interesting. Um, there you go. Learn stuff too. So, uh, great. Well, um, you know what? I'm thinking it doesn't look like there's uh, any more questions coming in, Joel. So I think what we'll do is uh, is we'll shut down for the uh, for the evening um, here. And uh, you know, being that it's already 10 o'clock uh, in Montreal, you're probably uh, probably looking forward to taking the evening off and uh, and relaxing a bit now. Um, so uh, thanks once again for coming out and doing this. Uh, some great stuff there for uh, for people to think about. Um, it's been fantastic having you on the show, and uh, and hopefully we'll uh, be able to get you back again in future. <laughs>